Ivins was, of course, right in saying that men, people, tend to see and value only what the pictorial techniques and conventions of their time are calculated to show them. From pictures made by those techniques and in accordance with those conventions, we learn what is worth looking for and looking at. And never before in the world's history has a change in the technology of picture making so suddenly and drastically altered pictorial conventions and hence our ways of seeing as the development of snapshot photography has done. What differentiates snapshots from all earlier modes of picture making is that they taught us to see things not even their makers had noticed or been interested in. The snapshots you and I make always call our attention to things we were unaware of when we pointed the camera at them. And not infrequently, when we pick up the finished prints at the drugstore, those unnoticed elements of the scene are obtrusively evident. And on occasion, they prove to be as interesting as, or even more interesting than, the things we intended to record. For the camera lens is, after all, indiscriminate. Unlike our eyes, it pays equal heed to the light reflected from the surfaces of everything within its field of vision. Unless the photographer deliberately interferes in some way, which amateur snapshot makers are not, or didn't used to be, likely to do, the pattern of forms and textures revealed in a print made from a photographic negative is determined by the impartial objectivity of light, not by the photographer's subjective preoccupations and aesthetic choices. The light's down again, please, in the next picture on the left. would leave the other screen dark. Center that one, yeah, and get it just as sharp as you can, please. I'll give you a moment to look at it after it's in focus. Forgive the light. Look, for instance, at this snapshot from my aunt's album. One summer day in 1902, someone with a camera in hand stood on the front porch of Mr. Ger George Burnham's summer cottage on Sutton's Island off the main coast, taking pictures of the sea and of Mount Desert Island in the distance. There are several such seascapes on contiguous pages of my aunt's album, all of them taken from that place. At some point, the photographer turned and noticed my mother, then a young woman of 24, and George Burnham's daughter, Persis, at the sheltered end of the porch, mother reading, Persis writing letters at a trestle table, islanded on an oriental rug. Whoever it was behind the camera saw, I suppose, two young women in a delightfully relaxed vacation moment, and after centering them in the camera's finder, snapped the picture. What the camera recorded, however, included many things of which the photographer was surely unaware. I'll let you look at it a moment again without the light. Inconspicuous but significant details such as the dog curled asleep on the rug under the table where Persis has tossed the crumpled pages of answered letters or of impulsively discarded drafts of her own. Salient aspects of the scene, such as the oddly juxtaposed rocking chairs in the foreground, with their tightly laced rattan seats and backs. The reflection in the window above them of a pine tree silhouetted against the sky above Mount Desert and against the intervening ocean. The reflections of its branches blurred just enough to indicate there's a breeze coming in off the water. The texture of weathered shingles and the sawtooth profile they make at the corners of walls and columns. 
the intricate zigzag perspective of receding openings framed by the serrated edges of those columns and by their inverted reflection in the varnished matched board ceiling. Like the photographer, I have a personal interest in the people who were evidently the intended subjects of that snapshot. Both of them became important in my life. One is my mother, the other is my beguiling, adventurous, lavish, and much loved adoptive aunt. And yet for me, and I suspect for the photographer, after seeing the finished print, this is less a picture of the young women than of the asymmetrical space in which they are centered, a sharply defined space open to sunlit woods, but itself only very gently illuminated and in an inexpressibly touching way, almost absolutely shadowless. My point here is simply that by isolating a group of forms and textures within the arbitrary rectangular frame provided by the edges of its glass plate or film, a snapshot forces us to see and thereby teaches us to see differently than we would have seen through our own unaided eyes and also differently than people had been taught to see by pre-photographic pictorial conventions. All pictures of any sort have edges that cut off our peripheral vision and thereby dissociate their forms and surfaces from surrounding forms. By the mere act of isolating certain forms and textures in this way, all pictures give enhanced significance to whatever images they contain. But the peculiarity of the snapshot photograph is that the hierarchy of images within its frame is not ordained by the picture maker. Whatever hierarchy of forms appears in the snapshot is ordained by the indiscriminate neutrality of light. Once people began to look at snapshots they had taken, they therefore began to see as significant a great many things whose significance they had never seen before. The next picture on the right, please, and turn off the left projector altogether. They probably didn't altogether enjoy being forced to see in this way. I do not suppose, for instance, that my aunt was pleased when she printed this snapshot to see the prominence it gives to the shabbily dressed men on the corner and to the old overcoat and dirty blanket thrown over the back of the trash cart's horse. She had been on a sentimental pilgrimage to downtown Philadelphia one day in 1885 to take a picture of a building at the corner of 4th Street and Apple Tree Alley, which 40 years earlier had been the house where her mother, my grandmother, lived. Long before 1885, when the snapshot was taken, the building had been remodeled for stores on the ground floor and tenements above. No doubt my aunt wished that the idle blacks and the dump truck and horses would go away so she could get an unobstructed view of the building. Certainly she wasn't interested in the street traffic or she would not have angled her camera to get in as much of the house as possible even though by doing so she cut off the horse's legs. Yet the picture she took as she must have realized when she saw the print, nullifies whatever sentimental selectivity there may have been in her vision of the house as an historical object. Thanks to the snapshot's unbiased hierarchy of forms, we cannot help seeing historical truths of a different order. Unarguably truthful images of urban realities 
which were in fact a part of the house's history and are here inextricably associated with it, no matter how disinclined the photographer may have been to see them. It's more than a mere chance of chronology that the classic book about life in the tenements and the slums of our cities appeared in 1890 at the end of the first decade of snapshot photography. And that it was written by a man who had taken thousands of snapshots in the hallways and rooms of tenements, in slum alleys, in cheap lodging houses, sweatshops, and degraded hovels of all kinds. Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives was a powerful and influential book, precisely because its author had a snapshot sense of the reality of life in the slums. Many of his pictures were made in places so dark he could not have seen in advance the details of texture and form that the snapshots record so convincingly. They were taken by the light of the explosive flash produced when a mixture of powdered magnesium and potassium chlorate, chlorite is ignited in a pan. It's a blinding light, but so brief were the exposures that the snapshot was made even before, before the subject's eye could blink shut in reaction quite literally, quicker than a wink. Reese was thoroughly aware of how basically his knowledge of the actuality of the tenements was founded upon his documentary snapshots of the inhabitants and their surroundings, and he wanted to show that reality to others. The title page of his book proclaims, the next one on the left, please, that it is illustrated chiefly from photographs taken by the author. No, the next one on the left. Please. <coughs> and the stories that he wrote as a police reporter for the New York Sun were also illustrated from his <coughs> photographs. But it is misleading to be told as we are in some histories of photography, that although Reese's writing was effective, it was his camera that was decisive in making his work an incontrovertible, powerful weapon in his successful campaign to have rear tenements torn down, child labor laws strengthened and enforced, police lodging houses abolished. Reese's photographs are indeed compelling and incontrovertible, as many of us have seen for ourselves. Thanks to Reese's son, who gave the original glass plate negatives to the Museum of the City of New York. Thanks to Grace Mayer, who was then the museum's curator of prints and photographs, and had excellent prints made from the plates. Those wonderful pictures are now often reproduced and have become a part of almost everyone's consciousness of our urban history. But relatively few of Reese's contemporaries ever saw them, for there was no effective technology for transferring photographic images to the printed page. The first halftone reproduction of a photograph had been printed in a newspaper in 1880, but even in 1890, the quality of halftones was still so crude and undependable that only a dozen of the 43 illustrations in How the Other Half Lives were made directly from Reese's photographs, and those dozen are the least convincing of the lot. The most effective pictures in the book are those printed from engraved plates of pen and ink drawings based upon the photographs. The next picture on the right, please, and also the next on the left. And spread them all the way. Further, good. A little further. Yeah, that's, that's an important figure there. A good example is this picture captioned in a Chinese joint, signed Kenyon Cox, 1889, after photograph. On the left screen is the photograph after which Cox's drawing was made. 
Notice how the photograph bears out what I said earlier about the way a snapshot's arbitrary edges enhance the significance of every element of the pattern of forms and textures they isolate, as the frames of all pictures do. But notice also that the hierarchy of images in the snapshot, the ranking or grading of forms and textures according to their visual significance, is determined by the unbiased play of light independent of the photographer's volition. One can guess that if Rees himself had made a salon print from his plate, he would have cropped it to exclude some of the same elements Kenyon Cox decided were pictorially irrelevant. But there they are in the snapshot, and they are by no means irrelevant except from the point of view implicit in traditional notions of pictorial balance and coherent design. From that point of view, the ominous half-faced figure at the right is a disruption of pictorial unity. Its presence in the design raises questions the design itself does not and cannot answer. The next pair, please. The same sort of thing is true of this pair. On the right, Reese's photograph of a child in the stairway hall of a tenement house. On the left, a pen and ink sketch that was published in the New York Sun as an illustration for one of Reese's articles about raising the slums of Mulberry Bend. No doubt Reese himself, had he been the artist who translated the photographic image into a line drawing, would have eliminated the same visual elements that this sketch eliminates. For example, the mysteriously blurred image of the adult slum dweller intruding from unknown upper stories of the tenement into the barren solitude of the forlorn child. He would have realized that there was little use in trying to devise a linear translation of the photograph's record of the meaningless refuse on the hall floor, or of the texture on the uncropped expanse of wainscot in the left foreground, of the irrational hieroglyphics of desolation. None of that incontestable imagery was translatable into other visual terms. And none of it, therefore, could have been communicated to newspaper readers at the time, even if Reese or the paper's picture editor had wished to include it, which they almost certainly would not have wanted to do. For even now, when good halftone reproductions of photographs are possible, people with a cultivated sense of pictorial design would be inclined to crop Reese's negative eliminating areas at the left and at the right in order to achieve a better, that is to say, more balanced and coherent design. Let me show these pictures. In New York and many other cities, coast to coast, shared a revolutionary change in their vision of how the other half lives, my aunts and their friends acquired a shared snapshot awareness of how they themselves lived. Part of the significance of albums like theirs inheres, of course, in what they do not include. There are, for instance, no close-ups of faces or objects in my aunt's album, since she had no lenses capable of producing them. But technical deficiencies do not explain the absence of pictures of the kitchen in my grandparents' house, though every other room, except the bathroom, is recorded. Nor do they explain the absence of any pictures of the servants who worked in that kitchen, the only snapshots in the album showing members of what we still irrelevantly call the working class are one of a four-horse private coach with a portly coachman on the box, 
and the one I showed you earlier in which the two blacks are apparently idling on a street corner. Not until the second decade of the 20th century was it possible for almost everyone to have a snapshot awareness of the world beyond the precincts of his own life routine. By then, however, it was not only possible, but practically unavoidable. Everyone's Sunday newspaper had a rotogravure section or a pictorial magazine, and though these supplements contained a fair share of posed portraits or mug shots of the great or the notorious, snapshot images appeared with increasing frequency. Editors were well aware of the convincing qualities of snapshot vision. Late in 1918, the pictorial magazine of the New York Sun, Jacob Reese's old paper, published what it labeled the first actual photograph of ex-Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany in exile. The next one on the right, please, and you can cut the left screen for the moment. <coughs> He's riding in the carriage in that tilted rectangle at the center. And just below it to the right, what it proudly calls a snapshot of the former crown prince standing with others on the deck of the small boat that took him ashore in Holland. The prince is the man at far left, pointed to by a small arrow superimposed on the snapshot so you could see that the person most worth your attention was not the one the snapshot called your attention to. Editors were also aware that snapshot images were important historical documents. When the Sun published two pictures of the signing of the armistice, both of them drawings, it did so under a boxed caption which said, unfortunately for history, no photographs of the armistice proceedings were taken, and these drawings constitute the sole record. It was indeed unfortunate and would have been even if the drawings had been more compelling than they are. For as Ivan said at the end of that wonderful book of his, at any given moment, the accepted report of an event is of greater importance than the event. For what we think about and act upon is the symbolic report and not the concrete event itself. By 1918, the nonverbal symbolic reports upon which men were willing to act and about which they were willing to think seriously were predominantly reports made by the snapshot camera widely reproduced in newspapers and magazines. Yet as the New York Sun's art critic Charles Fitzgerald said a few years earlier, the camera had the awkward habit of reporting the significant and the impertinent with equal indifference. That habit was indeed awkward for those photographers who were exploring the possibilities of photography as art, who wanted to make pictures expressing their personal vision, their subjective decisions about what is and is not important. Only a very few photographers have ever succeeded in using the camera effectively to that end. The overwhelming majority of photographic images have been made by people who were content to let available light determine what was significant. The cumulative effect of 30 years of mass participation in the process of running amok with cameras without ever pausing to ask, is this or that artistic, had been to the discovery that there was an amazing amount of significance, historical and otherwise, in a great many things that were deemed impertinent until snapshots began forcing people to see them. I'm not making the absurd claim that every snapshot has importance as a revelation or even that any sizable group of snapshots like an album full will surely reward you with an awareness of the hitherto unrealized significance of some class or type of forms or surfaces. I am saying 
that because snapshots often revealed impressive or delightful significance in things no earlier mode of seeing had enabled mankind to see, our postulates about what really matters have been profoundly altered. And I'm also saying that because snapshots taken a century ago and those now on TV news programs made in quick succession half a world away can be seen, thanks to the modern technology of transmission and reproduction, by almost everyone in our world simultaneously, we really do live in what we can call a snapshot world. What the consequences will ultimately be, no one can know. What some of the consequences seem to me to have already been is worth noting. In all the arts, indeed in all our attempts to impose order upon chaos, one can see during the past hundred years a new concern with the significance of surfaces, a new preoccupation with objects as we have been forced to see them by light's non-selective revelations. Much has been written, for instance, about the way the development of what we call modern art from Courbet through Seurat, Cezanne, and Picasso parallels the development of photography and owes many of its technical and formal elements to photographic imagery. Think, for instance, about the snapshot composition of Degas' canvases, whose edges arbitrarily crop an implicitly larger scene or about Monet's technique of capturing the fleeting effects of light with his so-called comma brushstrokes derived from the halation or blurred aura of light around bright or moving objects in photographic images. It is surely more than a coincidence that the first exhibition of paintings by the French Impressionists was held in a Parisian photographer's studio. Similarly, the patterns and forms revealed by such technologically advanced snapshots as the photomicrographs of organic and inorganic substances or by time-lapse photography have taught more than one of our contemporary painters and sculptors to see such patterns elsewhere, if only in the mind's eye. The next pair, please, both projectors at once. At first glance, you may wonder which of these is a photograph and which of these is a work by some modern artist. In fact, both are photographs. The one at the left, a microphotograph of the crystalline structure of a metal. The other, a time-lapse photograph of a drop of cream's behavior when it falls into another liquid. Take them off now. Blacken screens. I'm sorry, I need to. In literature, too, snapshot vision has had notable consequences. It's well known that the modern novel and short story have been profoundly affected by the movies, but it's worth reminding ourselves that there are lots of other evidences. It was a group of poets born in the snapshot era who associated themselves just before World War I as the self styled imagists brought together by a professed desire to be free of formal conventions and of all restrictions upon subject matter, and by a determination to use the language of common speech to present hard and clear images. We are not a school of painters, their spokesman wrote, but we believe that poetry should render particulars exactly and not deal in vague generalities. Surely these imagists had been affected by their awareness of the visual precision and the unconventional subject matter of instantaneous photographs. Perhaps the most important and far-reaching consequence of snapshot vision has been its impact upon our sense of history. Few would deny, I think, that the publication of Thomas Beer's The Mauve Decade in 1926 and of Frederick Lewis Allen's Only Yesterday in 1931 bore witness to a fundamentally changed conception of what history is. Their authors were born, respectively, in 1889 and 90, 
members of the first generation born in the Kodak era. I can think of no writer of history before Beer who would have begun his book with a verbal snapshot of such an apparently trivial event as the one Beer selected, the aged and garrulous Bronson Alcott, father of Louisa May, hanger-on of Emerson, stepping back in bewildered shock from the edge of Emerson's grave, his face startlingly bloodless, a small boy pressing forward among the assembled mourners to get a look down into the hole, the distraught Alcott grasping the boy with a grip so cruel that his daughter raised her hoarse spinster's voice in the hush, commanding, Pa, let go, as she stooped to wrench the child's arm free. You're hurting Georgie's arm. Both books are full of what Alan called tremendous trifles. Those in Alan's book being events and things which his readers remembered well, as if they had happened only yesterday. And they remember those tremendous trifles, the sordid divorce trial of Daddy and Peaches Browning, Lindbergh's transatlantic flight, the pig woman testifying in the Hall Mills murder trial from a hospital bed wheeled into the courtroom. Because they had watched them through the snapshot images of thousands of newspapers, the permanence of this imagery endlessly proliferated surely had much to do with the recognition of such events and circumstances as significant data of history. Since then, history has moved even closer to us. History for our generation is the tremendous trifles that we're going to watch on news this evening and have watched in recent memory. Tremendous trifle like Lee Harvey Oswald being escorted by police down a jail corridor in Texas as a paunchy man steps forward and shoots him. Aldrin and Armstrong kangaroo hopping on the dusty surface of the moon. One of the local television stations in Albany advertised recently, our news team can cover a fast breaking news event at nine o'clock and have it on the air at nine o'clock. You can't get it any faster than that. Electronic news gathering means unparalleled speed in news coverage. It makes the difference between news we can talk about and news you can see. When Columbus returned to Portugal to report having reached the East Indies by sailing westward, fetching along an alligator and some gold as proof. The event was already months in the past and not yet very convincing history. It must have been many more months before people in Europe like you and me heard even rumors of this altogether dubious event. Four centuries later, when Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner took their stark photographs of dead soldiers on the battlefields of the Civil War. It was a quarter of an hour or more before even they themselves saw the unarguable realities recorded on their glass plates, several weeks before the public saw even secondhand wood engraved translations of them, and several years before the photographs themselves were seen by more than a few hundred people. Stepping ashore at San Salvador and Hispaniola was actuality. A dead soldier splayed in a shell hole was actuality. Neither was history until people possessed a symbolic report of it. Reports made in verbal symbols, however vivid or detailed, are open to doubt, as Columbus discovered. So is the most carefully drawn or painted picture. So is the translation of a photographic image into the most conscientious wood engraver's syntax of lines and dots. Therefore, history for many centuries was something untrustworthily reported that happened long ago 
thanks or no thanks to the snapshot, history is now what we live in from the moment we are old enough to look at the pictures our parents take of us. That is one consequence of the modern technology of visual communication. Our now at once becomes history. And for most of us, history is our own individual now. Other consequences are flowing from the fact that willingly or unwillingly, we are participants in a revolution in seeing. The revolution which began, as noted earlier, when people like my aunt began running amok with snapshot cameras almost a century ago. Call it, for want of a better term, the democratization of vision. From the innumerable images objectively recorded by undifferentiating light in the snapshots we and others have taken, all of us have begun to learn the import of certain lines in Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Let me read a few of those lines while you look at some pairs of snapshots on the screen, and that'll end this session. Okay. All truths wait in all things. Next pair. The insignificant is as big to me as any. Next pair. I do not call one greater and one smaller. Next pair. That which fills its period and place is equal to any. And the last pair. And there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cowenhoven. And Mr. Cowenhoven is now open for questions from the audience. If you want to. If you would like to ask him any. Tawadi, you can ask me if you want.